What happened in the last election? We have to know exactly what happened so that we can also prepare for this upcoming one. Were there any things that happened that were a violation of law or that were just unethical, unfair? I know a lot of you are shouting yes. Well, let's get into the specifics of it. David Bossie, who is the president and chairman of conservative advocacy group Citizens United and was 2016 deputy campaign manager for Trump. He has a new movie that just premiered yesterday, rigged the Zuckerberg funded plot to defeat Donald Trump. Uh, we have a trailer up at clayandbuck.com right now. Rig2020.com is the uh, website for this movie. And one of the uh, experts who appears in it is the former attorney general of the state of Virginia, Ken Cuccinelli, who is with us now. Ken, thanks for calling in. Hey, my pleasure. Always good to be with you guys. So let's start with just the 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 overview here of this movie seems to it's the Zuckerberg funded plot to defeat Donald Trump is in the title. What exactly did the CEO of Facebook do in the 2020 election? I mean, rigged is the title. So obviously a lot of people are paying close attention. So in 2020, uh, through two. A 501c3, which most of us typically think of as charities, he funneled over $400 million to finance government election offices. And his explanation was, well, we just want to help them do their job better. Well, that's just sweet, isn't it? Except there were strings attached. Some of the strings were so substantial that literally their own personnel went in and ran election offices, for instance, in Wisconsin. And so you literally had situations in densely uh, populated Democrat areas, Philadelphia, Detroit, Madison, Wisconsin, other places, where the offices were operating under the rules given to them by Mark Zuckerberg's um, outfit. And those rules included what amounted to Democrat voter turnout, so instead of the government in these locations being a neutral uh, arbiter, I would the analogy I would use is the basketball ref. They were paid by one team to do their job the way that team told them to do it. And, um, and that included get out the vote efforts, which are absolutely fundamental for both parties in trying to win elections. And you had the government doing the Democrat Party's job with the funding of Mark Zuckerberg. And it clearly, the numbers show, it tilted the scales dramatically. You may recall that some people thought it was peculiar that Joe Biden beat Donald Trump. At the same time, Republicans picked up around a dozen House of Representatives seats. Well, how does that happen? Because the Zuckerbucks, so-called, were concentrated in already Democrat areas. So they already had Democrat congressmen. There was nothing to be gained by the Democrats in Congress by this spending, but there was in the presidential race. But in the other districts where Zuckerbucks didn't have an impact, Republicans actually beat the Democrats to an extraordinary degree from a historical standpoint. Ken, appreciate you coming on. Do we have any sense for what the plan is of big tech as we are now almost exactly seven months out from the midterms? Is this almost exclusively a presidential fueled move on the part of big tech or do we anticipate something similar uh, being brought to bear in terms of the midterms this year? So from from the things we've learned so far, it's pretty clear they thought this wouldn't be discovered this quickly, that they would do this for several years before anybody figured it out. Um, and, of course, it was figured out almost as it was happening, not fast enough to stop it. So thus far, about a third of the states have banned or severely limited the use of these kinds of grants, including on a bipartisan basis, by the way. Everybody recognizes how unfair this is. And, you know, that leads to a lack of confidence in the outcome of the election because it looks and feels like cheating. There's a reason they named the movie Rigged, um, because it was. And I think Steve Moore in the movie says they legally stole the election, <laughs> um, which is a clever way to say it. Um, but steps have been taken and are continuing to be taken to make sure that the referees aren't allowed to be bought again in the future and that government does have to play a neutral role, unlike what it did in many places in 2020.
We're speaking to Ken Cuccinelli, former attorney general of the state of Virginia, about the new movie just premiered yesterday, rigged the Zuckerberg-funded plot to defeat Donald Trump. Uh, the trailer's up at clayandbuck.com right now. If you go check on it, you'll see it uh, there. Ken, how are we looking then going into this midterm election where the polls are, and we, we try not to have it's too much early celebration on our minds here about it, but the polls are looking disastrous for Democrats going into this midterm. But how are we doing? I mean, Democrats aren't going to go down without a fight. We know that even if they fight dirty, they love fighting dirty. How are we doing with, you know, the mail and balloting situation, drop uh, drop boxes, people that are there to check and make sure that everything's on the up and up at the voting centers? I mean, how are we prepared this time versus in the 2020 election? Have fixes been made? Uh, a lot of fixes have been made in a lot of states. I would say we have years of work ahead of us. I mean, if you think back to Bush v. Gore and what a disaster Florida was shown to be in that 2000 election, um, it wasn't fraud. It was just incredible level of incompetence and inconsistency. And um, it took them years to clean that up. That's just one state, including firing a lot of people that needed to be fired. But that's a three, four, five year undertaking. So we're in year two of trying to clean this up. And in Florida, it hadn't become a political football. You know, everybody agreed Florida needed to be cleaned up. Now the Democrats, or at least the radical left part of the Democrats, um, treat election reform and transparency and security as um, uh, a, an attack on them. And uh, because they they want uh, incoherence, they want incompetence, they can hide their fraud in it. And um, so they really don't want it cleaned up, though they can't really say that. Uh, So there is a fight over this. It has become a lot more partisan than it used to be. But down at the state level, real progress is being made. As I told you, Zuckerberg's bans in Virginia and Kentucky, for instance, passed in the last month or two, uh, were done on a bipartisan basis. Um, And uh, there's... If you just put a random hundred Americans in a room and asked them the details about how to run an election, overwhelmingly, we'd all agree with each other. This is common sense. It isn't partisanship, but it's become partisan because the radical left and their media allies have turned their attacks on efforts to clean up elections because they think dirty elections advantage their side. The movie is rigged. The Zuckerberg funded plot to defeat Donald Trump. Rigged2020.com is the website. Ken Cuccinelli, sir, thanks for your work on this. We appreciate you joining us. My pleasure. Good to be with you. We are going to spend some time now updating you with the latest from the war in Ukraine. How is this going? What is the reality of the uh, Russian pullback from around Kiev is this just regrouping for another round of assault on the capital city there. How is the Biden administration handling all of this? Uh, we're joined now by Dan Hoffman. He's a former CIA station chief. Dan, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me on the program. Let's just start with your your 30,000 foot view of where is Putin vis-a-vis where he expected to be at this stage and and how would you assess the Ukrainian resistance is is holding up against the Russian onslaught? Yeah, so we've just gotten into the seventh week of this war, which Vladimir Putin called a special military operation when he launched it. I think Vladimir Putin expected to defeat Ukraine quickly, decapitate the government in Kiev, and uh, install his own puppet regime. Well, thanks to those brave Ukrainian uh, freedom fighters, that's not the way it turned out. Uh, President Zelensky mobilized the West, which has supported Ukraine with not enough, but some military assistance that is helping Ukraine stay in the fight. But this is all about those brave Ukrainians fighting for freedom and liberty and, and democracy uh, against a ruthless enemy. And, and this is where, you know, the geopolitical fault line is right now uh, between democracy and dictatorship. It's in Ukraine. You know, we We've fortified our support to, to NATO members. That's part of the Biden administration's three-pronged strategy, which also includes economic sanctions against Russia and military assistance to Ukraine. But Ukraine, that's where the fighting is. And there's no country uh, that's done more uh, than Ukraine has to defend, deter, and counter Russia, which is what NATO was established to do in the first place. 
But the, the, the big concern for me was testimony yesterday from General Milley, who said he thinks this conflict might last years. I think he's right. If, if, if we're lucky, if, if this is where the, uh, the Biden administration continues to go in terms of their support to Ukraine, but we don't have years. How many more uh, atrocities do we want to witness on Ukrainian soil? How many more cities like Bucha? Uh, or maternity wards like the one that the Russians bombed in Mariupol. How many times do we want to see that? There's a moral and ethical component to this. We need to up our ante in supporting the Ukrainians so we can end this faster, not allow it to continue on. What about, Dan, thanks for coming on the show. What about leaving Ukraine and going to Russia? I know you've spent a lot of time analyzing the situation in Russia. Reports are that Vladimir Putin's approval ratings, to the extent that you can rely upon anything in Russia, have actually increased during this war. Do you buy that? How much internal political pressure do you think is on Putin inside of Russia? Yeah, so those those polls are notoriously uh, inaccurate because if you ask somebody what they think of the war, it's either I love the war, oh, not a war, special military operation, or they're going to jail if they're lucky. So I don't I don't really think that that uh, that, that that really tells us a whole lot. But I also don't think Vladimir Putin is under any threat from the Russian population writ large. I mean, he's repressing them pretty uh, seriously. They're not allowed to protest. There's no free media in Russia. Uh, and the only ones who could potentially uh, cause Putin any trouble are his own inner circle. If they decide that they just don't want to take the orders from the KGB guy in the Kremlin anymore to inflict these atrocities on Ukrainian citizens, maybe not for that reason, but because they – um, they want to send their kids to school in the West, uh, and they want to continue to steal whatever money they can from Russia's export of hydrocarbons and other natural resources. Maybe that will motivate them. But that's kind of, you know, a, a replay of the uh, failed KGB coup against Gorbachev has to be lurking in Putin's mind. And so he's going to do everything he can to prevent that from happening. We're speaking to Dan Hoffman, former CIA station chief. Dan, what do you think Putin is trying to get at here meaning what would be an end state where he'd be willing to stop uh you know stop the onslaught in ukraine is it just the east and the south and the land bridge between them in ukraine how do you see this coming to a conclusion yeah so i think that's an incredibly insightful and important question that i'm sure that the Biden administration keep members of the administration are asking our intelligence community right now, what are Vladimir Putin's plans and intentions? My reading of this is that Vladimir Putin has gone so far uh, and committed such atrocities against Ukrainian citizens, which are brave, uh, you know, very intrepid journalists from Fox News, where I work and other networks have recorded, thank goodness. Um, there's so much of that that I just think Vladimir Putin is in this thing. He's got to win. And he needs an immediate win before May 9, uh, which is, you know, of course, a, a big day in Russia, uh, the day they celebrate the victory over, over Nazi Germany. And he needs to show some success. And, and whatever this, he can show, he'll, he'll, uh, he'll add a lot of, you know, Russian propaganda to that. Uh, but I think longer term, you know, Russia withdrew 20 battalion groups back to Belarus to resupply and refit them. And he's sending mercenaries from Syria, the Wagner Group, and Chechens uh, into into Ukraine. I, I just feel like he still wants Kiev. I don't know that his his ultimate goal has not changed. He definitely wants to fortify the position in the east. He wants a complete land bridge all the way to Crimea. He wants Odessa and the besieged uh, Black Sea city of Mariupol. But I don't think he's given up on Kiev, and that's got to be the concern. We, we we haven't, you know, we we need to win this. Uh, you know, and right now I think we're kind of allowing Ukraine to stay in the fight and not lose it. Dan, they had been battling in eastern Ukraine since 2014. As you reference, this battle now could go on for years. How long is the United States, let's be frank, going to care that much? If we end up in some sort of really aggressive and ugly stalemate, already you can see Ukraine slowly moving outside of the national news cycle in the United States. How long are people going to remain committed to paying attention to this conflict? And what is that impact in terms of the political pressure that the attention can bring to bear? Well, I think that's over to the Biden administration. You know, the president needs to get up on his bully pulpit and explain to us why Ukraine matters, uh, why defending Ukraine's independence matters. 
Um, and, you know, right now, President Zelensky has kind of been doing that job for everyone in the West. He's the one who is so eloquently, um, uh, you know, so eloquently led and uh, spoken about defending liberty and freedom and democracy, the things that we hold near and dear. Um, he's the one who awakened the West out of this post-Cold War slumber that we were in. Um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, the Ukrainians are sacrificing right now with their lives, and it's like they are ready to go until the very last civilian, forget about the last, you know, of their soldiers. And I think we've got to continue to support them. Uh, and Dan, can I just ask, because you, you've said that, I just want to know, in terms of doing more, clearly the Biden administration mm-hmm. is giving some weapons. What is it just a volume issue? Are there some weapons or or some interventions that you think would be a game changer on the um, battlefield? What What is more? Yeah, so I think they need more javelins. They need more stingers. They received some T-72 tanks from the Czech Republic. They need more of those. They need more drones. We should have given them MiGs, um, and we still should do that. They need air defense, the S-300 systems. Those are still there. They're in Slovakia. Slovakia wants something in, in, you know, to take the place of those S-300s. We need to do that as well. I mean, there is a – these are massive war crimes on Ukrainian civilians, and – we got to do something to stop it because that's the right thing to do morally and ethically. Uh, but also uh, we can't let Vladimir Putin win. We can't reward his aggression. Uh, that puts those NATO member states, especially on, on Russia's border, especially the Baltic states uh, among others at, at grave risk. And uh, that's one of them, a few of among many reasons I think why this matters. But if, if American citizens are wondering why this matters, well then, There's a failure of communication there on the part of the Biden administration to explain it properly. Good stuff. Dan Hoffman, former CIA station chief in Moscow. We appreciate your time. Hope to talk to you again soon. Sounds great. Take care, everybody. We're joined now by Missouri Attorney General Eric Schmidt to talk about the chaos at the border that is looming as Title 42 will be repealed and removed as law by May the 23rd, I believe it is. Attorney General Schmidt, appreciate you making the time. What is going to happen come the repeal of, uh, of Title 42, and what legally can be done to fight the decision of the Biden administration? Take us into that uh, story, if you would. Yeah, I think well, you've seen waves and waves of illegal immigration since Joe Biden's taken office. I mean, we have an open and porous southern border, um, and we've had a lot of challenges there. And you see the, the coverage, not on the mainstream media, but you'll see it on certain outlets where it is covered. But the repeal of Title 42, which was a Trump era policy, which allowed essentially because of of covid, the Trump administration put this in place to turn away illegal immigration. And by many estimates, about 50 percent of all those turned away are because of Title 42 and Border Patrol agents uh, are able to apprehend folks. Uh, that's going away. If you know, we filed a lawsuit, but that currently is going away uh, next month at a time where you're going to see a seasonal increase anyway. Uh, and the estimates are that it will double the numbers of people coming in here illegally. You've seen the waves and waves. This will be a tsunami of illegal immigration. And that's all, uh, you know, exaggeration aside. I mean, what we're about to see a month from now, we've not seen this before. Now, Missouri and Texas filed a lawsuit on the uh, Remain in Mexico policy last year. We took that to the Supreme Court and won. We're fighting with the Biden administration to get that reimplemented. Uh, we've also filed a lawsuit. Missouri and Texas has filed a lawsuit to finish the border wall. That's another piece that was, you know, again, you look at what was working under President Trump. We had a secure border uh, and Joe Biden on day one, you know, stopped funding for the border wall, essentially pays contractors not put it up. I've been down there. They're literally 30 you know, foot high sections. They're rusting on the ground. Uh, the migrant protection protocols remain in Mexico is working. He eliminated that. We've had to go to court. And so now we're going to go to court on Title 42. It's just it's a mess. And uh, it's going to get worse. Attorney General Schmidt, it's Buck. I I was hearing early on that even after the Biden administration had to give way to the the sanity of the remain in Mexico uh, protocol, that they their whole plan was essentially to just slow roll it. And then the early stages they were putting, I think the number that I heard this was some months ago, but it was dozens of people through it. Do we know if it has that continued on? Has that been their plan or have they actually been uh, using that program in a way that shows that they will at least obey a judicial decision on it? No, they slow walked it. You're right, Buck. And in fact, um, 
uh, the Border Patrol agents express a lot of frustration when I was down there. You know, you talk to them one on one. Uh, they've a lot of the tools that they had at their disposal have been taken away. The other thing they did is they slow walk. They claimed that they had to, you know, renegotiate with the Mexican government. I mean, this is the United States of America. I mean, you can. President Trump was able to do this pretty quickly. They could have, too. So they've slow walked it at every turn. And, in fact, later this month, guys, we'll be back at the Supreme Court. I think it's April 24th. It's that Tuesday, the last Tuesday in April. We'll be back in front of the Supreme Court, Missouri and Texas will, uh, because we got a TRO in a preliminary injunction. But this is now, you know, for the whole shooting match. They brought, they're bringing that back now to the Supreme Court. So we've had those wins. We expect, well, we're hopeful that we'll be able to, you know, have that be a final order and and force them to implement it more effectively. But this Title 42 is the newest piece, right? They held back on this because I think you even see Democrats, Joe Manchin and people are talking about Title 42, you know, revoking that or rescinding that is going to be a disaster. So, you know, this is on purpose. There's no accident about this. And the other thing, you know, I've been down there twice. The cartels are running the show. One law enforcement official told us when we were down there, me and some other AGs, $100 $100 million a week is the value of the human trafficking. I'm not even talking about the drug trafficking that's happening, the human trafficking. And, and people ask, why is Missouri filing this lawsuit? Well, every state's a border state because the drugs and the crime and the human trafficking, it doesn't stop in El Paso. It doesn't stop in McAllen. It ends up in Nashville. It ends up in St. Louis. It ends up in Ohio. It ends up in you know New Jersey. So these cartels have networks throughout the country that, they're running drugs and people, and it's very dangerous. And uh, we don't know who these people are. We don't know where they're coming from. It's a national security problem as well. Attorney General Schmidt, we, I, you just hit on something that, that I was going to ask you about, which is what is the impact of all these Democratic senators who are coming out and saying, hey, we disagree with the Biden administration decision here? Because you could have potentially five to ten even as many Democratic senators saying, hey, we don't support this is there any kind of legal impact of a eventual vote that could take place in the Senate and how would it impact Biden's abilities when it comes to this regulation and how might that impact your lawsuit? Well, I think, you know, one of the bigger issues, and I think, um, Clay, when I was on the, the show, when we were talking about the OSHA mandate, Missouri was the first state to file that lawsuit we took at the Supreme Court and won on the OSHA mandate. The same issue there is the same issue here, which is, a runaway administrative state, right? That's not accountable yes. to anyone in trying to, to, and this is a much bigger problem. And, uh, but as it relates to this, I think the pressure from Democrat centers could get the Biden administration to think twice about empowering essentially the CDC and uh, Homeland Security to be moving forward with this because as they seek to, you know, unravel Title 42, they could back away from that. Now we're going in, into court to say, look, first of all, you haven't even done it the right way. You haven't had a notice and comment period, which is a very technical term. But also, um, you're not weighing, you know, it's arbitrary and capricious because you're not weighing the downside with what you perceive the upside to be of this massive wave of illegal immigration. So that's the nature of our lawsuit. But there's political pressure. There's no doubt that could be applied to get the Biden administration to, rever- to reverse course. And as I said, this is not that there's ever a good time to do this. This is the worst time to do this because you're going to see a seasonal surge anyway. So you're going to have double the numbers. If you have 7,000 a day, you're going to have 18,000 a day by many estimates. So this number is going to be, you know, could be half a million more per month. Uh, This is just not what a sovereign country does. You know, we get lectured all the time by the, you know, the CNN types about the sovereignty of other countries' borders. We have a southern border right now that, you know, is completely porous and open, and that's not good for our country. We're speaking to the Attorney General of the great state of Missouri, Eric Schmidt. What do you think this does to the Democrats in the midterms, uh, Eric? It feels like Clay and I were trying to figure out before the political angle of kicking the border more wide open than it already is. I mean, it's already bad. Border Patrol will tell you that last year was pretty much the worst year in memory in terms of lawlessness, illegality, cartel exploitation, all of it. They think this year is going to be worse. What is? What do you think the Democrat plan is here? Well, I can't. I can't answer that. I, there's. It's not by accident, and maybe they think it's going to reshape the electorate. But I think what's also interesting is you look at these border counties in places like Texas. They're getting. They're getting more and more red. People don't want lawlessness in their communities. They don't want this illegal activity. They know that the cartels are running the show. 
in El Paso, um, schools get shut down all the time because of these, you know, the illegal immigrants streaming across. And they're, you know, happen to be near the border. So schools get shut. People don't want to see it. I think there's a reckoning coming, guys, on a whole bunch of different fronts. Uh, you've seen this in school board elections. You've seen it in Virginia. I mean, San Francisco <laughs> recalled school board members because they want to rename George Washington High. I mean, this stuff is nuts. The American people know it's nuts. And I think that this, you know, this cycle, they're going to pay the price. They should. They And we're not having traditional political debates in this country about tax rates and entitlement reform. They're talking about adding states to the union. They're talking about packing the Supreme Court. They're talking about federalizing elections. They're talking about opening up the border. I mean, they want to fundamentally change this country forever. And I think that um, my hope is, my prayer is, uh, that uh, there's enough people who understand we got to save America in every election you know, in the primaries and the general in 2022. A.G. Smith, last question for you. You mentioned the arbitrary and capricious nature of the decision as it pertains to Title 42. While simultaneously saying that COVID, it's not safe for people to be in airports or on airplanes without masks, the same agencies are saying, but it is safe enough to limit the rules uh, that were put in place for COVID at the border. How do you reconcile the disparate treatment there? Does that provide any avenue of appeal for you as well? Yeah, no, it's definitely a fact, right, to point out. But I think it also points out to the just purely political nature of all of this. And so, you know, for me, I think when I was on the show last time, we were talking about I've sued, you know, 45 plus school districts in Missouri. Uh, We sued, you know, OSHA for the vaccine mandate. This, the CDC in particular and, and Anthony Fauci, have completely weaponized that agency for political purposes. These so-called public health experts are nothing more than political operatives. And here we go again, right? We've got, they want to, they, they want to encourage illegal immigration. So it's not an issue, but you still, but Americans still have to wear masks on planes. I mean, this stuff is nonsensical, but uh, the good news is I think people see it, but there's no question. Those, those issues will be relevant in our lawsuit. Outstanding stuff as always. Yes. Thanks so much, sir. Appreciate it. Hey, guys, yeah, and I didn't even mention I'm at Cardinals opening day, so I found a quiet place to do the do the interview. I was a little nervous about that, so I'm glad we could do it without uh, screaming Cardinal Nation in the background. But Hey, enjoy it. It's a good day with the Masters back, Tigers on the course, Major League Baseball opening day for a lot of places enjoy, uh, as well. we got a good affiliate in St. Louis. Appreciate them and enjoy the game up there. Love what you guys do. Take care. Thanks so much, sir. We are joined now by Alaskan Senate candidate, Kelly Shabaka. Uh, she is running in the primary that will be going on. And then I want to ask you about this, uh, Kelly, because I, I think it's kind of fascinating. And I know we've got a lot of listeners in Alaska, but you guys have ranked choice voting, is my understanding, and a top four end up being able to compete. How will that work? What would you tell people who are listening to us right now that want you to defeat Lisa Murkowski? How should they rank going forward? What is the way that the voting will exist there compared to what a lot of times is different than uh, than a usual election? Well, it's great to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm calling in from Norvik, Alaska, which is on the western edge of our state. So we're like a border state with Russia. So I'm hoping that the connection stays great. As far as ranked choice this November, the answer is really simple. The top four candidates will go forward. Right now, it's basically a head-to-head with me and Lisa Murkowski. We're both going to the general election. The Democrat has dropped out. I don't know who the other two candidates will be because there's nobody else who's raised, you know, more than several thousand dollars. The answer for everybody who wants Kelly to win is put Kelly as number one and don't put anybody else. And I'm confident that we have a really strong chance of winning The Alaska Republican Party has officially censured Murkowski. They did that before I ever announced my candidacy. She is not allowed to use the Republican name in her election. She's running to, quote, keep Alaska independent. You know, like Bernie Sanders is independent, and she's voting a majority of the time with Bernie Sanders now. And then the Alaska Republican Party has endorsed me as well as President Trump. I functionally am the Republican nominee, and Alaska always votes Republican in statewide elections. So when it comes to this ranked choice business, if you just vote Kelly and keep everything else blank, I'm confident I will be the number one candidate in the ranked choice scenario. 
anybody else who drops off, your ballot's still going to count. We don't need to worry about anything else. And so a poll that came out last week by Breitbart says that in this ranked choice scenario, I will win by two points currently. And we still have seven months to expand that lead. So it's looking really good. Kelly, it's Buck. Uh, I just want to say thanks for joining us. And I, I've been very clear. I mean, I, I don't have to do what some you know journos, I'm not a journalist, do where they pretend not to support or not support one way or the other. For me, the Murkowski vote against uh, Kavanaugh is is an unforgivable political sin. I'm just wondering if is that what spurred you on to decide that Murkowski doesn't really represent in any meaningful way the GOP? I mean, what what got you into this race? Why did you decide that you wanted to do this? But that's definitely one that's really high for many Alaskans. It's like she indicted him simply for being male. And she opposed Kavanaugh. She filibustered Amy Coney Barrett. And then, of course, what the heck did she do yesterday in giving her full support to this justice who bends over backwards to defend child sex abusers and refuses to distinguish between two genders? For me, this is really concerning as an Alaskan mom of five children. But the vote that absolutely got me into this, I am not a politician by background, even though I am an anti-swamp bureaucracy whisperer. February 24, 2021, I watched Lisa Murkowski cast the tie-breaking vote to advance the nomination of this radical environmentalist, Deb Holland, and to be Biden's interior secretary. And she said, this will hurt Alaska. I have misgivings about it, but I'm going to do it anyway. And she did this knowing that Deb Holland planned to champion Biden's energy annihilating agenda. And with that single vote, she killed thousands of oil and gas and natural resource jobs across our state without feeling it at all. But I felt it like a kick in the gut because my mom got an oil job before I was born. And that oil job helped my parents fight their way into working class America because my parents had ended up being homeless in Alaska And they just struggled like heck to get their feet up under them. But it was because of that oil job that they moved into a mobile home and then into their starter home and then had me. And if it wasn't for that job, I don't know where our story would have been. So Lisa Murkowski doesn't feel it, though, Buck, because her dad literally appointed her to that Senate seat. She is the product of Washington, D.C. insiders and the political elite. She doesn't depend on the resource industry in Alaska. She doesn't know what it means to depend on other Alaskans, but I owe everything to this state and to the Alaskans who came around my family and gave us the opportunities we had. When she killed all those jobs, I just thought she's not fighting for us. You know, she's fighting to be popular in D.C., but who's looking out for all of us Alaskans? I'm going to fight for the people who fought for me. It's just that simple. Kelly, you got an incredible bio. you got five kids, as you just mentioned. Your parents were homeless in Alaska for a time. You were the first in your family to go to college, and then you went on to Harvard Law School. What was the cultural <laughs> experience like for you to go from Alaska to all the way into Boston and find yourself at Harvard Law School? I went to law school. It's a bit of a cultural challenge for anyone. What was that experience like for you? Well, the best part of Harvard Law was meeting my amazing husband, who uh, is a first-generation Congolese immigrant. Uh, His dad grew up in a mud hut in the rainforest of Africa, and I love my husband dearly. However, at Harvard Law, they don't take very well to outspoken conservatives from Alaska, and I won't be bullied, and I won't be silenced, and I won't be controlled. My dad always said, you know, talk straight, kid. They might not like what you say, but they always know where you stand, and that's called integrity. And I really value my integrity. And so they posted death threats regularly against me in the student common. And I think that's funny when liberals and leftists post death threats because, look, I grew up in the land of predators. When you walk outside your front door, I was taught to look both ways because you don't know what's going to eat you. And so uh, it just didn't faze me much because, um, you know, this is Alaska and you got to look out for yourself no matter where you're going. And there's just not much bite to leftist spark. I guess I'll put it that way. And so I've also learned, looking back, that going to Harvard Law and having all those death threats really trained you well for running for the U.S. Senate. And that was my experience there. Uh, I got trained well. I learned well, but I didn't stop talking and expressing my conservative views. So uh, that was Harvard. (laughs) We're speaking to a Senate candidate for the Republican Party in Alaska, Kelly Chewbacca. And uh, Kelly, I just want to know, because there's so much focus on 
the energy industry right now and how obviously the price of gas people are paying at the pump is a major concern for a lot of families struggling to make ends meet the geopolitical situation because of Russia, Ukraine and the price of of gas in recent weeks and how that's affected it. Um, what is the truth? Because the, the Biden administration makes it seem like they're they're all in favor, you know, drill wherever you want. Lots of permits out there. You must know in your home state of Alaska what the truth is of this and how are they making it harder to produce fossil fuel energy and to bring down those gas prices with domestic production in Alaska? So Biden's an expert at the blame game. You know, for a while it was Putin's fault and it's the meat industry fault, the oil industry fault, Republicans' fault. Um, It's really only Biden's fault. When Biden feels at the blame game, he then plays the spectrum of deception game and this misinformation thing. Oh, well, look up here because we talk straight. We just call it lies. There is a anyone who knows the oil industry knows that you can give out the permits all you want or the leases all you want. But if you kind of draw the analogy to a lease in an apartment building, we can sign the papers. But if you don't hand over the keys, a paper is meaningless. That's sort of what they're doing. They'll say, oh, you know, we've given out all the leases, but then they'll hold us up with the permits. They'll hold us up with environmental survey reviews. There is an entire process in the oil industry of once you get a lease, you've got to get your permits, you've got to get your environmental surveys, you've got to go through exploration, development, drilling before you can actually start producing. So I'll give you the example of ANWR. The courts have said open ANWR. Congress has said open ANWR. Trump let us open ANWR. Biden has come in and shut it down. And even though everybody has told him open it from courts and Congress, et cetera, Deb Holland, who's only there because of Senator Murkowski, has held us up saying she has to redo the environmental impact survey that was previously done and approved over two years. Remember, we've done decades of EIS reviews and passed them all simply because she wants to hold us up. So we're cleared and green to go for ANWR, and Deb Holland's the one who shut us down. So that's kind of that spectrum of deception I'm talking about. Oh, we've said drill, baby, drill, and they're the ones who are shutting us down. If you want to know the real truth, I've toured more miles in state than it takes to circumnavigate the globe. Here I am in Norvik. I can't even count the number of people I've talked to who in one year have gone completely bankrupt, lost their homes, lost their cars, lost their bank accounts, lost everything. Because of this Biden administration and all their money that was tied to oil, whether it was jobs, contracts, et cetera, all because of the decisions made by Deb Holland, confirmed by Lisa Murkowski. So do not believe those lies. I'm sitting up here fighting for the people, just like my mom and dad, who have lost everything because of them. Kelly, if people want to support you instead of Lisa Murkowski, what would you tell them to do? You told them how to vote. Where would you tell them to go? We're at Kelly4AK.com, for, Kelly for K-E-L-L-Y. F-O-R-A-K.com, Kelly4AK.com. Fantastic Thanks stuff. So we appreciate the time. That's Kelly Shubaka. She is running as the Republican in Alaska, potentially to beat Lisa Mur- Murkowski. That is going to be a race worth following for sure. Biden is creating the worst illegal immigrant crisis ever. That's the headline up at foxnews.com opinion right now. I wrote it last night because I'm just furious about what's happening here. We've been trying to update you about every step of this disaster as it is unfolding with the end of Title 42, but everything the Biden regime has done so far has been it seemed like they want the border to be wide open. They want there to be massive, massive inflows of illegal immigrants into this country. Somebody who knows this issue backwards and forwards and was on the front lines of trying to secure the border during the Trump administration is Stephen Miller. He was a former senior advisor to President Trump in the White House. And he's also the president of America First Legal. He joins us now. Stephen, great to have you back. Great to be here. Thank you. So, Stephen, I've been talking to my Border Patrol sources this week and checking in on the numbers as they stand so far, as well as the projections from DHS. We're we're staring at what feels like the, the immigration iceberg, so to speak, and the Biden administration is yelling full speed ahead. Unprecedented illegal uh, immigration numbers a month away. What's going on here? Well, I often tell people that I've run out of actions to describe how bad it already is. You know, when Joe Biden came into office in January of 2021, we were already within a few weeks of him taking the oath of office in a full-blown border crisis. We all remember the images for that hot minute when the media was actually covering it, and then they realized, holy crap, this is terrible for Biden's poll numbers. We're not going to talk about it again for a year. The situation since then has gotten unimaginably worse. We've 
we've gone from four or five thousand apprehensions a day to now eight thousand apprehensions a day. So we have we've doubled what was true five alarm fire crisis levels. That's where we are now. So it's much worse than anything we've ever had before in American history because 2021 was the highest level since records have been kept. That's your starting point. Your baseline under Joe Biden is the worst year in American history. So how do you even describe where we are right now? Not, not in May when Title 42 is gone. Right now, today, when we are at 8,000 apprehensions a day, plus 2,000 gotaways that we know of a day. And by know of, I mean these are people Border Patrol sees escape or they're able to deduce the size of a group from footprints or from a fence cut or from drone surveillance, etc. So that's 10,000. And then you have another group, which are the unknown gotaways, which, of course, by definition, are unknown. So your, your daily numbers crossing exceed 10,000 a day right now. No nation in history has experienced an illegal immigration uh, wave of that size ever. You can't find any historical precedent for it. You can scour the history books your entire life. It's now on top of that, they're saying, okay, now let's get rid of Title 42, and we're going to go from 10,000 to some unknowably larger number, at which point in time you could get any thesaurus in the world. There'll be no adjectives left to describe how bad that is. Stephen, appreciate you joining us. I'm reading Marco Rubio from this morning. He uh, tweeted out, several Central American leaders have informed me traffickers are spreading the word Biden's going to allow anyone who crosses the border to stay if they file for asylum. A massive illegal immigration surge is coming, and those who push to end Title 42 are to blame. Okay, so let's presume that this is true. Buck and I were discussing this yesterday, Stephen. What could possibly be the goal of the Biden administration in making this choice given that their approval ratings are already total trash, they're staring at a red wave in the midterm election. What is their game plan? What are they gaining by this? Why are they doing it? Well, if you look at several positions of the Democratic Party, I would argue that this is the one that will have by far the most irreversible consequences for our country. Uh, but, you know, for, if you look at their policies on, on crime as an example, if you look at their policies on critical race theory as an example, they're all enormously unpopular with normal human beings, uh, really including in the Democratic Party, too. So the question, of course, becomes why. I think the answer to that is that Democrats are interested and have always been interested in long-term structural power. And so they're willing to sacrifice short-term pain for long-term gain. First of all, I think they've already written off Biden. I'm not the first person to say this. I don't think they think he's going to be the nominee. Um, and I, I don't think that they think that if by some miracle he were to become the nominee, uh, that he'll be in the Oval Office five years from now. So they're playing the long game here, and they know, look at California, that large-scale, uninterrupted illegal immigration, and, and by the way, nothing that we have today even compares to what was happening in the 80s or 90s. It's so much worse today that it's California times 10. But you look at California, this was the state that went for Nixon, went for Eisenhower, went for Reagan, went for H.W. in 88. Basically, one of the most conservative states in the whole country. Beautiful coastline, beautiful weather, and wildly conservative. Basically paradise. Now look at California. So they understand that they are setting the stage for long-term democratic governance. We're speaking to Stephen Miller. He is the president of America First Legal and a former senior advisor to President Donald Trump. Stephen, are, are you seeing indicators, because some of the people that I that I know and, and work with who really dig into the minutia of DHS rules and regulations and how the bureaucracy functions, they're already saying that one of the plans here is going to be to make it easier for illegal, once Title 42 goes, they're going to streamline the process so that we won't see 15 or 20,000 person, uh, you know, uh, camp sites, so to speak, or groupings by the border the way we did months ago. It'll just be invisible largely because there'll be so many people going in and immediately being let into the country with either a notice to appear or an alternative to detention policy, which just means essentially the honor system. Is, right. is that even is that possible? I mean, can the bureaucracy do that and get away with it if the Biden regime says that's what they want? It is possible, and it's indeed the plan, and you're very wise for mentioning it. So since the beginning of the Biden administration, 
their entire strategy for dealing with the mass migration that they invited has been to accelerate its entry, right? Hence, like, the secret flights that we've all seen covered on Fox News and elsewhere. So when they add bodies to the border, when they add more personnel to the border, when they add more facilities to the border, it's not for the purpose of repatriation, you know, i.e. deportation. It's for the purpose of getting people here illegally and more quickly inside the country. And so if you remember going, again, back to when we had those images early on of people overflowing Border Patrol facilities, their solution to that was not to get people back home, which would have made the whole problem go away in a few weeks. Their solution was to line up more transportation to get those people more quickly to their city of choice inside the United States. So that is going to be their sole and entire strategy for the, the tsunami of illegal immigration that is coming and building and, and growing. And to your point about asylum, and this is especially insidious, so we know that these are not asylum seekers. Everybody understands this. These are overwhelmingly economic migrants, and then there's also, of course, a portion of criminals, a portion of drug traffickers, a portion of sex traffickers, et cetera. But you know, that's, your, that's your grouping. These are not people that are, with, with rare exceptions, uh, that would meet any recognized definition of asylum. But if you change the regulations, which they're doing, to make it easier for someone to get asylum and, and to allow them to get that benefit far more quickly, you're minting new citizens at the border. When you're granted asylum, I don't know if many people realize this, that doesn't mean, oh, you get to live here. No, 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 no. Asylum is a six-year path to American citizenship. Once you're granted asylum, you're immediately eligible for all federal benefits in the country. Within a year of granting asylum, you're eligible for a United States green card, which makes you a full permanent resident. Five years after that, you can become a United States citizen. So the goal here is to create an illegal alien to citizen pipeline. Stephen, you mentioned that you don't think Biden will be the nominee and that some element of this is about the long game, not about any time, uh, any current political calculus necessarily. Who's the nominee for the Democratic Party in your mind if you had to place a bet right now in 2024? I don't think that they know, which is part of the reason why they are so panicky right now. Uh, I don't think that they know because logic would say that it would have to be the vice president, Kamala Harris, who has arguably had the worst debut as a vice president since anyone has been keeping track of these things. Uh, She's the only person who has somehow managed to be even less articulate than Joe Biden. But if you were to say you go beyond Biden, you go beyond Harris, and you look more broadly, I could see a situation where they take a hard look, for example, at Gavin Newsom. Now, you and I, if we were advising somebody running against Gavin Newsom, we could come up with a list of 500 lines of attack. But I think for them, they would always, the next place they would go would be, okay, who who are the governors of large Democrat states? But I don't think they know who their nominee is going to be right now. Do you think Hillary might be the nominee? I think they're, they're, she would like to be, I'm sure. Uh, just whatever she may say publicly in her heart, I'm sure that she would like it. And there's still obviously a pretty strong Clinton faction in the party. I don't think that faction is strong enough uh, to overcome the, uh, the AOC wing of the party. I could be wrong. Uh, obviously... Uh, Obviously, in Biden, they went with a throwback. Turned out that he's the most radical leftist president in the history of this country. But uh, I don't know if they'll be able to do another throwback candidate again. Do you think immigration, Stephen, could be an essential component of, as we're calling it, the election reckoning that we hope happens in 2022, if the American people know about it? Is it high enough on the radar? Does it get enough attention that this could be a critical piece of really delivering a stinging rebuke to the Democrat leftists. I would go even further than that. I would say it's indispensable. It's not only something that can give us a massive majority. I think that if we want to win the size of a majority that we're going to need to repair the damage that's been done over the last year plus, you know, will be two years by then, we have to put this as a central issue before voters. That's what gets you from a modest Republican majority to a historically large Republican majority. And here's the other trick with this. The reason why Democrats have gotten in the way in the past with illegal immigration, of course, again, what's happening now has no comparison in history, is because Republicans haven't played the populist card against it. 
So their hope is that they can keep their um, uh, their share of the vote amongst Latino voters and amongst other immigrant voting blocs while then continuing to have large-scale illegal immigration. And Republicans will just sort of do the Paul Ryan of, oh, well, we're for this too. Well, illegal immigration is great. If you actually go to minority communities and immigrant communities and you say, Democrats are destroying your economic prospects, they're destroying your schools, they're destroying your health care, your safety, they're putting drugs in your communities – they do not see you as equal citizens, but you're pawns in their game. You can make huge gains in those communities, and that's when you're a wipeout territory in the midterms. That's where we need to be. Stephen Miller, everybody, America First Legal. He's the president, formerly advisor to President Trump. Stephen, always appreciate your expertise on this, my friend. Thanks for being with us. Thank